Welcome back to our Wednesday night Bible class over the book of Daniel here at Bear Valley Church of Christ. Tonight we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 9. This is our 10th lesson within the book of Daniel. And Daniel 9 is very interesting concerning the prophecies of the Messiah and the Messianic kingdom. Now, Daniel 9 is one of the most disputed chapters within biblical literature. Depending on what scholar you look at, whether he's left or right, um, and depending on what teacher you have, Daniel 9 can be taught primarily about three different ways. Uh, outside of those three ways, you have other ambiguous interpretations and, and readings of Daniel 9. And I'm going to show you simply just one of those ways that we can interpret Daniel chapter 9. I would encourage you to do uh, more research on this and to maybe fact check me over the next few weeks uh, concerning Daniel 9. However, I think that this way of looking at Daniel 9 makes sense and it definitely fits a timeline uh, within its specifics. Also, according to Daniel 9, we're going to be looking at several truths that remain truthful no matter which way you interpret it. That's one of the great things about the Bible is it gives us a depth that will keep us reading and studying and digesting uh, for all the years to come. However, there is still a bottom line truth that is shallow enough for us to reach in and grab and to have that installed into our hearts. Daniel 9 is very interesting in a number of different facets primarily because it's looking forward to the messianic kingdom and that's one of those truths that you really can't get around within Daniel chapter 9. For Judaism uh, the Jews had somewhat of a timeline to figure out when the Messiah was coming and this is one of the most uh, comforting thoughts that we have especially as Christians in terms of how do we know that Jesus really was the Messiah? Certainly that's one aspect that we struggle with in our minds as Christians is having that confidence in our faith and having that assurance not only because of the miracles that Jesus performed when he was here on this earth in the first century but also looking at Jesus from the Old Testament gives us great insight and allows us to have confidence in knowing that Jesus the man was also Jesus God and when we look at Jesus from the Old Testament we get to witness an incredible testimony uh, especially from the book of Daniel into who Jesus is what he accomplished on this earth, and what he will continue to accomplish in his kingdom in the future days. Now, Daniel 9 starts off in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 through 19, as Daniel praying to God, basically saying, we've messed up as a people. Your Israel, your nation as a people, have turned away from you, O God. When you look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 5, 11, and 13, you'll have this phrase that is simply the idea of turning aside. Now Daniel uses this in three different or in two different ways in three different passages. This idea of turning aside has been used in Daniel chapter 9 verse 5 and also in chapter 9 and verse 11 to show that they had turned aside from God. Notice in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 5 it says, We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and your rules. God, when we looked at his covenant, he made this bilateral covenant of saying, if you will be my people, I will be your God. Meaning that there is a conditional statement on this, that if you are not my people, then I will not be your God. But here in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 5, Daniel is coming to terms with the fact that we as a nation have turned aside from your commandments and your rules. Now, certainly we can look at rules in the New Testament as far as staying within the household of God, specifically looking at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and having that stewardship, having those house rules for God. But I believe that's a discussion for a latter time. Right now here in Daniel chapter 9, Israel is finally coming to terms with the fact that they have turned aside from God. And then when you jump down to chapter 9 and verse 11, there you see all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. Now again, here you have the second position of this turning aside. Not only have they turned aside from his commandments and his rules in verse 5, but notice what they've turned aside from in verse 11. His voice. There are great chapters within the Bible, uh, such as Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, where we there have an introduction to Abraham. And among Abraham that we have this great patriarch in our mind, this great man of faith who is recorded in Hebrews chapter 11, this legend, if you were to have it, 
he did not know God prior to God revealing himself to Abraham. There in Genesis chapter 12, we see that God spoke to Abraham. It was God's voice that allowed Abraham to come to know the one and true God. And upon hearing this voice, Abraham then began his journey of knowing and understanding and coming to a relationship with God that was deeper than any other relationship. And obviously that relationship with God allowed Abraham to do so many great things within Genesis and within the biblical literature that we have uh, for our studies. So they have turned aside against God and his rules and his commandments, but they've also turned aside from God and his voice. God sent several prophets in order to tell the people to basically correct themselves, that you have gone off the road. It's time for you to get back on track and to continue straight forward in this righteous way of living. And yet these people have gone aside from both things. Um, and then when we look at uh, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 13, there Daniel shows the fault in why they were turning aside from God and his law and his voice. Uh, there in verse 13 it says, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning aside from our iniquities. There he is saying, we have turned aside from God and everything about God, but we have not turned aside from our iniquities. So there you have it, as Paul would discuss in Romans 3 and also in Romans 6, that you have two options. You've got life and death. You've got sin and righteousness. So when you're looking at sin and, right, or sin and death, you are turning away from God and life and righteousness. But when you are turning to God and life and righteousness, then that sin is turned aside from you. Again, we are uh, very functional thinking people in terms of we like to think in terms of mechanics. So when you look this way, you are turned aside from this way. And when you look this way, you are turned aside from that way. Here, Daniel is saying the reason why we were turning away from God is because we refuse to turn away from our iniquities. We refuse to turn away from man-made traditions. We refuse to turn away from everything that we thought was good in our own eyes. It's simply the fact that we have two options to make. As a people and as a nation, and certainly Daniel recognized in Daniel 9, that as a nation, they had uh, failed at this tremendously in turning away from their iniquities. And because they failed to turn away from their iniquities, they had in turn uh, turned aside from God. Now, here's one cool thing. When you look at Daniel 9, kind of these, this section of 1 through 19, as you have a dichotomy taking place as far as Daniel in his prayer, he's saying, oh God, you are righteous and we are sinners. That there is this great uh, vastness between God the righteous and us the sinner. When you look at verse 7, it says, to you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. And then when you look at verse 9, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. See, there's always this dichotomy taking place in Daniel's prayer as he looks to God and when he's looking at this perfect standard of righteousness and goodness, you can't help but reflect on yourself and think, man, I am so far away from that holiness. I am so far away from that righteousness. And truly, there is none holy other than God. But then God gives us a chance to fix that condemnation on our own end. And that's what God is going to reveal to Daniel through the angel Gabriel. Now, last week in Daniel chapter 8, we looked at Gabriel. And when you look at passages like Luke chapter 1 and verse 19 and Luke chapter 1 and verse 24, we see that Gabriel is the one who is a great messenger for God. He's one of the archangels and he's one of the main um, angels in that angelic army. And God is using Gabriel uh, throughout the times. I mean, you think of the time span between Daniel and the first century. You've got some, some time frame over 500 years that God is utilizing Gabriel in order to convey a message. And so when you look here uh, in verse 20 of Daniel chapter 9, here we get into a next section. It says, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. Basically, Gabriel is now going to give this new revelation to Daniel. He says, At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, 
a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. That's one thing that we have to keep in mind as faithful people of God, is that even though we will mess up, even though we may turn aside from God, the fact remains that we are still greatly loved. And that's one, that's one of the first things that Gabriel wanted to mention to Daniel. As Daniel is basically here repenting in sackcloth and ashes, and as he is professing this great repentance to God and how they are unholy and how God remains holy, Gabriel came down and one of the first things he said to Daniel is, you are greatly loved. Sometimes we get in this mode of beating ourselves up far too much. Now, it should be uh, that we keep ourselves accountable, but hopefully not to the point where uh, we have lost all sight of redemption in God. And he says, Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks. Now, here's where everything starts to unravel in terms of theology and doctrines and commentators and, and things like that. Now, what I'm going to give you, again, is just one way of looking at this and it's the way that I think fits more precisely especially hopefully I can make a decent argument for it but these 77s or the 70 weeks obviously a week is filled with seven days so you've got 77s what do you do with that in terms of numerology especially within the book of Daniel and this is a divine message coming down from heaven so it's not too far-fetched to start thinking in terms of symbolic numerology what's taking place here within the 77s, or the 70 weeks. Well, when you take 70 times 7, the number that you arrive at is 490. Again, uh, I may be a minister and I may be a welder, but I can do some basic math. Um, you have 490 days, if you were, uh, within that numerology. Now, to the Jewish mind, there's really no error and switching days for years. Uh, again, it's one of those ways of having symbolic uh, interpretation take place. So you've got 490 days or translated to 490 years. What's going to take place in 490 years? Well, if you keep on reading, it says 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem and the coming anointed one, a prince. There shall be seven weeks. For the sixty-two weeks it shall be built again uh, with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come and destroy the city and its sanctuary, its end shall come with a flood, and uh, to the end shall be a war, and desolations are decreed. So again, Daniel's breaking, or Gabriel, really, through Daniel, is breaking down the 70 weeks um, times 7, the 490 years, into three different chunks. And so we're going to be looking at that in just a moment. It's also important to note that Daniel had been asking, how long are we going to go through all of this, this iniquity, all of this uh, time of, of refinement, of being in Babylonian captivity. Well, when you look at Jeremiah chapter 25, uh, verses 1 through 5, thereabout, you've got Jeremiah who is speaking as a prophet about the time of the end of when Babylonian captivity is going to take place. And then when you jump to Isaiah, Isaiah 45, there Isaiah is speaking through God of a, a tool that is going to and all Babylonian captivity for the people. And that would be Cyrus, the Persian. Well, Cyrus, in about 538, made a decree that all Jews can return to Jerusalem. And then you have deportations, three primary deportations of Jews back to Jerusalem over the course of quite a few years. Now, in those deportations back to Jerusalem from Babylon, the people are going to find their temple destroyed, the walls are broken down, and there's going to be two main components to rebuilding Jerusalem, is the wall and the temple. You're probably already getting ahead of me in your mind, but there we find two significant books in the Old Testament. Number one, Nehemiah, he is in charge of rebuilding the wall. Without a wall, you have zero defense. Without a wall, you have zero boundary. And so it was uh, necessary and and important to build this wall around Jerusalem. Not only that, you have to have the temple, of course, to make sacrifices and to have proper worship for these people. 
And so Ezra is going to come in place in rebuilding the temple and also uh, reestablishing the law. When you look at Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, Ezra there is uh, finding the law once again, and he's going to study it, he's going to install it into his own heart, and he's going to preach it to others. You see, there's this great aspect of Ezra in finding the law and also reestablishing the temple. So you've got three deportations back to uh, Jerusalem. You've got Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, and Ezra all taking place in different years. When you look at Ezra chapter 7 and verse 8, uh, you have this idea, this time frame as far as when Ezra is going to go back. And when we pinpoint that chronologically, you're looking at about 457 uh, for that year of Ezra returning back to Jerusalem and establishing the temple and the wall. Now also when you go to Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 and 7 and also Ezra chapter 9 and verse 9, you see that God is therefore instructing Ezra to basically rebuild and re-sanctify the temple. Of course, when we remember the destruction of Jerusalem was over 100 years ago from when Jeremiah returned back to Jerusalem. So the temple has been laid waste for quite some time now. It's been destroyed and there's almost nothing to rebuild from. So this is going to take quite a few years to rebuild. If you remember previously in Daniel, when you look down here at verse 25 and 26, you've got three different portions of looking at that the chronology as far as what's going to take place among these 490 years. So number one, you look at 25 and verse 25 and it says there shall be seven weeks. So seven weeks, again, we can look at seven, seven. So that would be 49. If we look at that as 49 years, you've got the rebuilding of the temple. And then our second portion, uh, looking onward in, in verse 25, it says then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again. So 62 weeks, 434 years later. And you have uh, Jesus's ministry starting in approximately um, around the 2630 AD time frame, depending on how you look at chronology, um, 434 years will put us perfectly within the start of the first century. If you remember, Jesus uh, grew up in the first century, the start of the first century, and he was then baptized, and then his ministry lasted for about three and a half years, three years, depending on how you look at it. Um, but that'll put us around the year 26 AD. Um, and then moving forward, then you have this very short time frame in the book of Daniel in verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off. Well, very shortly after 26 AD, um, if you look at three and a half years, which would be appropriate to our numerology, then you have 30 AD, again, plus or minus about three years for all of this, uh, you're looking at the crucifixion of Christ. So 49 years rebuilding the temple, fast forward 434 years, you've got Jesus coming and starting his ministry on earth, this anointed one, the prince. And then after that time, that appointed time in three, or in three and a half years, you've got the crucifixion that takes place looking at the book of Daniel. And notice in verse 26, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come uh, shall destroy the city. Now, here's where we have a differentiating point um, from the prince who is the anointed one and this prince in verse 26 where it says and the people of the prince uh, again remember that this is a different uh, person this prince from the previous anointed one it says who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary its end shall come with the flood and to the end there shall be war desolations and are decreed and then he goes on in verse 27 looking at everything that's going to take place as far as the persecution that's coming when we look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 45, we see that there are in chapter 24 and verse 15, we see that there is a great abomination coming to the Jews in the first century, previously spoken of in Daniel chapter 8. So again, I know there's a lot of numbers floating around. There's a lot of interesting things taking place. But what we can deduce from all of this is that 77 equals 490. If you translate that into years, 490 years, 49 of those years are going to be spent uh, rebuilding the temple according to John chapter 2 and verse 20. And then 434 of those years, you're looking at the start of Jesus' ministry, which is to take place, um, that this time is being rebuilt, that the anointed one is coming. And then after a portion, a small portion of time, three and a half years, that anointed one shall be cut off. And then there shall be a tumultuous time, a time of persecution that comes there after it. Now, that's kind of one interpretation of looking at uh, Daniel chapter 9 and 
the 77s uh, for that time period. And that gave the Jews ample enough time to expect the coming of Jesus. When you look at passages like chap- or Luke chapter 2, verse 38, and Luke chapter 3 and verse 15, you see there in the beginning stages of Jesus' life that there were those who were expecting. It was a state of expectation. That the Jews knew that God had been silent for nearly 400 years after the prophet Malachi. And up to that point, you've got um, God not interacting with his people like he was in the Old Testament. Well, this was all to take place in preparation for Jesus Christ coming, the anointed one, uh, for him to establish his kingdom. Now, we as Christians, we don't know the day or time that Jesus is coming again. His second coming is still kind of in the air. We have no clue. It could be five minutes from now. It could even before the, be before this recording is even uploaded. But what we do know is that he is coming. The first coming of Jesus was a little bit different. They had pretty good insight that they could pin it down as far as when Jesus was coming. And this was another way to validate that Jesus was the Christ, that no matter how many other false Jesuses there were or false messiahs there were, that this time of the first century, this was ample time. This was the perfect time for Jesus to come to this earth and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. And we obviously, obviously see that kingdom uh, unlocked in Acts chapter 2. Now, like I said earlier, no matter how you view this, I, I think that this is the proper way. No matter how you view it, there are still truths to behold within Daniel chapter 9, that regardless of how you interpret it, speaking of the Messiah and Messianic prophecy, there are six truths that are still in place for Daniel and his people and also uh, in our time. And those six truths are found in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Notice here it says, Seven weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. Two, number one, finish the transgression. So transgression will be finished. And when you look at passages uh, like Romans 8, 1 through 3, you would realize that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So that transgression is finished. Number two, when you keep on reading in Daniel chapter 9, it says, put an end to sin. And again, when you look at passages like Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, we realize that Jesus was the one who put an end to sin. Um, Looking at Jesus as, as the main sacrifice, as the sacrifice, John would also speak about this in his first epistle in 1 John chapter 1, that Jesus is functioning as our advocate and our propitiation, and his blood allows us to have fellowship with God. Um, Number three, notice how it says to atone for iniquity. And when you look at passages like Romans 5, 6 through 11, Jesus did just that. Number four, keep on reading. It says to bring in everlasting righteousness. Meaning that this righteousness is not fading. um, That it is one that will follow your soul into eternity if you are faithful to God. When we look at Isaiah 51, uh, that's a good passage to look at when realizing what all Jesus would do in this uh, function. Um, But also looking at Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 10. We see that Jesus gave us a great opportunity to be holy um, as God is in that sanctification. Number five, to seal both vision and profit. So visions and prophets are going to be sealed up under the work of Jesus. And you can look at Acts 3.18 for that as well as um, Hebrews one. 1 through 3.
And then, finally, number six, it says to anoint a most holy place. Again, looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 through 9, we realize that this was a work of Jesus. Now, I will give credit to Dave Chamberlain because uh, he is the one who taught this section as well as many other sections within the book of Daniel when I had him at Bear Valley Bible Institute as a student back in, I think it was 2016 is when I had this class on the book of Daniel. Um, But these are six truths from Daniel chapter 9 that remain truthful no matter how you look at the book of Daniel. And that's really what's important within interpretation is finding the common denominator, finding the common truth and the unescapable truth when looking at passages and tricky passages at that, such as Daniel 9. Now, obviously, there is a a lot of fun, I think, in looking at interpreting Daniel 9 as far as the 77, um, not 77 as in one number, but 70 times 7, making 490, and how that almost fits perfectly with the rebuilding of the temple, with uh, the coming of Jesus and his ministry, and then also when Jesus would be cut off and turned aside from everything. Now, Again, I would encourage you to go back through and look at Daniel 9 for yourself and maybe uh, challenge yourself in how you would look at Daniel 9. Again, this is just one way of, of three primary ways. But the main thrust of Daniel 9, I believe, is the fact that Jesus was coming and that the Jews were to be ready for the arrival of Jesus. Now, the Jews had in their mind a different idea of what a Messiah would be. They had in their mind a warlord, especially when you look at guys like Nebuchadnezzar, Um, King Belshazzar, you've got Darius the Mede, Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, all these people who rose up to prominence in the ancient world and who were warlords. Well, logically, what they would believe in is Jesus being this great warlord, that he would rise up and that he would start conquering nations left and right and killing people and all this other stuff that they saw all these great rulers in their mind do. However, when you look at what Jesus was trying to accomplish His fight was not just with flesh. His fight was against spiritual things. That Jesus came to this world to be a servant. Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. That Jesus came to this world to be an offering for us. That he would be an atonement for sin. Or popular passages like John 3, 16. That God did not seek to send his son out of rivalry with other warlords. But God sent his son. Why? Because he loved the world. So when we look at Daniel chapter 9, we can see that Jesus already had his life planned out as far as what he was going to accomplish when he arrived in the first century. And certainly it's encouraging to know that when Jesus was born to this world, um, when he took on flesh and, and left his heavenly abode, that his plan from the beginning, even from the beginning before he was born, his plan was that he was going to save us from our iniquities. I think it's very fitting when looking at Daniel chapter 9, 1 through 19, that Daniel can't get over how wicked the people have been, how they have turned aside from God, how their transgressions have been uh, overflowing at this point. One of the first things that Gabriel told him was that you know that you are greatly loved and that God loves each and every single one of us, that God never hates us. He hates the sin that we get involved in. He hates the transgression, but that's why he sent his son. So tied up into an interesting uh, interpretation of 490 years, again, that's not the main point. A lot of people, and don't fall victim to this, a lot of people will focus way too much on interpreting numerology and things like that and miss the grand truth of that prophecy and of that message. Again, we're looking at Daniel chapter 7 through 12 and the message of Daniel. The message of Daniel was alluding that there is a Christ coming, he's anointed, He is the Messiah, and he is going to save mankind from their transgressions. The same transgressions that Daniel was so brokenhearted of in Daniel chapter 9, 1 through 19. So again, uh, maybe this was more of a confusing lesson than normal, and I apologize for that, but that is Daniel 9 in a nutshell. Thank you for joining us tonight, and I pray that you will find great blessing when looking at the book of Daniel.